Hi, this is Mark Arnold with another Fun Ideas podcast. And in today's uh, show, we have a very special guest, Mr. Tony Isabella. Yay! How are you, sir? I'm, I'm well. That's very good. Okay. We've known each other for years, but I don't think we've actually really met or spoken. I think we just always communicated by emails. This, this but, happens a lot with, with the Zoom things and, yeah. and also the conventions. Um, yeah. I was at Pensacon uh, last month, and although we've been friends for probably a decade and a half, it was the first time I met Adam Troy Castro face to face. So, and and that seems to be a, a regular occurrence these days at conventions. Right. And I know I've been friends with you at least since 2006, <laughs> because yeah. you did the oh the dogs are going to bark but we'll keep going uh you did the introduction to my very first book right. the best of right. the fun times. and i drew a little caricature of you i never asked you if you liked it but you know i, I did it at the time let's see if i can find it in here yeah there you go see i i have a face meant for cartoony there you go <laughs> now i don't know if i told you in the many times we've communicated in the past uh the first time I ever heard of you was in Crazy Magazine because that's what I was buying at Marvel, which you're probably like, why that of all the things I've done? Well, why not? Why not? <laughs> but anyway, uh, how we usually start the show is we just kind of uh, have you as the guest. Just tell, tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got into working in comic books. Uh, well, around in July of 1963, I, I learned to read from comic books before I was four years old. Mm -hmm. uh, adults used to read them to me. I paid close attention because I wanted to cut out the middleman. Mm -hmm. um, by the time I hit kindergarten, about a year later, I was writing. I was writing like little reviews of, of TV shows. And uh, I was writing little fictions. I was acting out stories with the old Marx army men, you know, those hard green plastic ones. <laughs> um, I used to get pulled out of kindergarten all the time because the principal would call me, have me brought to her office so she could show me off to <laughs> visitors. Like she had a damn thing to do with my being able to read and write. That was all me. Um, but it got me out of kindergarten, which, you know, was boring. Um <laughs> You know, so I kept reading comics and, you know, I was I was at the age when people thought I should be giving up comics. It was July 63. I was about 12. Mm -hmm. We went on a family vacation to visit uh, relatives of my father in Oneonta, New York, a uh, sleepy little town. Um, and everywhere along the way, because this was a pretty boring family vacation trip, I buy a comic book. You know, because they were all over the place. And my parents got very upset, especially my mother, with my using my souvenir money to buy comic books. I didn't see the issue. It was my souvenir money. When we got to Oneonta, New York, my great uncle had a cigar and magazine store. I headed directly to the comics, at which point my <laughs> mother kind of grabbed me and said, you can only buy one more comic book on this trip. <laughs> well, I was going to show her. I was going to buy a quarter comic. Mm. The only quarter, you know, but I had all the DC quarter comics. I wasn't really interested in the Archies. Mm -hmm. uh, so that left Fantastic Four Annual number one, the greatest comic book ever made. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't even like Fantastic Four. I had one, <laughs> read one issue and didn't care for them. Mm. But everything clicked with that annual, which I must have read over a dozen times on that trip. Mm -hmm. Had a great lead story, the longest story I remembered reading, had all the background on the FF. And mm -hmm. I realized making comic books was a job, and it was a job I wanted. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, I was training myself to write comic books. Uh, my backup job was going to be, you know, becoming Clark Kent. <laughs> so I went to work for the Cleveland Plain Dealer, a incredibly crappy newspaper, which was the tool of the rich and the powerful and still is. Mm. Um, we went on strike. The publisher called up the mayor and mounted policemen attacked our strike line. I got knocked to the ground by a you know frightened copy editor 
a horse hoof landed inches from my face. Hmm. I got up, dusted myself off, went home, called up Roy Thomas, who I'd become friends with, and we would exchange phone calls and messages, and said, Roy, is there any kind of a job at Marvel, even entry level, because I can't work for this place anymore? Well, as it turned out, there was. Mm. They needed somebody with a good hit knowledge of Marvel of the Marvel Universe, which was a lot easier in this yeah. was 1972. So <laughs> in 1972, it was pretty easy to have a comprehensive knowledge of the Marvel Universe. Mm. They needed somebody to help Stan Lee with a new line of British weeklies. Mm. So a couple of weeks later, I'm in New York starting work. Um, staff pay wasn't much. It was actually less than I was getting in Cleveland, hmm. but living in New York. But Marvel would give you lots of freelance opportunities. Hmm. And, you know, started out writing articles, some short stories. Hmm. Uh, and eventually, you know, was writing regular books and was editing uh, about half their black and white line. Mm hmm. So, so yeah, that's how I started. Very good. Now, it's funny that you mentioned the Fantastic Four annual because they are reprinting yet again all the Marvel Masterworks, but they're doing them. I don't know if you've seen them in a little smaller paperback size. Oh, no, I haven't seen and them. And they're a lot less expensive than <laughs> the original hardback size. So now it's 16 bucks a pop instead of like 50. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's like, oh, I think I will collect these now. So I've, <laughs> I've got through Fantastic Four Volume 1 and 2. And I've read, like, Spider-Man already and uh, a couple of the others. And it seems like they're putting them out on a monthly basis. But I'm just about to Fantastic Four Annual. I have read it before, but it's been, like, I don't know, forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm, like, at Fantastic Four issue number 13 or something. And I think it they put it in there after 17 or something like that in the book. But, yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. And that's that is a very good issue and i i know what of what you speak with all the little <laughs> technical information because yeah i, I kind of flip ahead and, you know and say yeah. what am i getting up to oh yeah i remember that and has like their <laughs> diagram of their giant complex or whatever you know fantastic for uh secret headquarters or whatever all that stuff and i thought you know to see that on the stands originally which i wasn't even alive then but i mean that must have been like what was that like, I guess? <laughs> well, again, it, it was, I was buying that quarter comic book to spite my mother. <laughs> so I probably wasn't expecting much from it other than to spite my mother. Mm -hmm. uh, and instead, you know, it opened up a whole new world for me. It, it was one of the pivotal moments in my life. Um, mm -hmm. The other one being when I, I lived, I grew up in Cleveland, which was a really segregated city. Um, my first black friends were comic fans who came from the east side of Cleveland to the west side of Cleveland to attend my comic book club meetings mm. at uh, the Cadell Recreation Center, uh, mm -hmm. a name that I'll, I'll get back to in a minute. Um, you know, I was 17 years old, maybe diversity wasn't really in my vocabulary. <laughs> I just thought it was unfair that my black friends didn't have more characters that looked like them in the comic books. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I said, if I get into comics, I want to work on characters of color and I want to create characters of color. Okay. So at, at Marvel, I ended up uh, writing Luke Cage for a while, the Falcon, mm -hmm. created Misty Knight, turned Bill Foster into B Black Goliath, a name right. I hated. I hated <laughs> that name. They wouldn't let me call him Giant Man. Giant Man had sold really bad mm. that's why the hulk kicked him out of tales to astonish <laughs> um so uh that was you know that was my start of, of what was probably the defining image you know part of my career that i work on characters of color i of course created okay. black lightning yeah, I was yeah. going to ask you about that because it's like, you know, it, it's just interesting. You you did come up with a character for one for Marvel and one for DC that's of some significance because, you know, in recent times, cool. which we could talk about, you know, it's become yes. part of the movie universe and had yeah. a TV show and all that stuff. But we will go into that, you know, over. Well, let, let me just circle back for a minute to Cadell Recreation Center. Mm -hmm. That was, of course, the site where 13-year-old Tamara Tim Rice was murdered 
mm. by a police officer that should have never been a police officer for the city of Cleveland. Mm. He'd been fired from other departments. He totally violated protocol. Uh, he shot the kid within seconds of their car pulling up and pulling up closer to the kids than they're supposed to. Mm. I mean, there are procedures for these. This guy and his partner, and his partner had a history of, of bad behavior, violated all these regulations, and they still got away with it. Wow. Uh, so the Cadell Recreation Center represents one of the really joyful times of my life and one of the most shocking tragedies of the city of Cleveland. Hmm. And it's that kind of stuff that motivates me to this day. Um, when I was at Marvel, I was dissatisfied dissatisfied with the fact that luke cage was an escaped convict <laughs> uh even if he was innocent uh had i stayed on the book he would have been completely cleared and actually gone back to school gone back to college mm -hmm. because i felt luke could be a better role model yeah um uh, i absolutely loathed and hated that steve engelhart made the falcon a criminal retroactively <laughs> Retro, it's not like, oh, he was, no, retroactively, Steve Englehart decided to screw with this character wow. and make him a criminal. Mm -hmm. um, with Bill Foster turning into Black Goliath, I was on a process. I wanted a more of a role model for the young Black readers. Mm -hmm. And although Bill Foster was basically taking his powers from Henry Pym's work, he was a scientist. He had his own lab. I mean, it, he was he was a step up, more of a role, role model. Well, I left Marvel. Uh, things got real shaky there after Roy Thomas left. Mm. Uh, revolving doors of editors, editors who wrongly considered me somehow a threat to, <laughs> to their positions. Uh, even moving back to Cleveland didn't end that. So when DC Comics made me a really attractive offer, which they, of course, never honored because it's DC Comics, <laughs> uh, I jumped ship and went to DC uh, where they wanted me to. The first thing they did, well, first thing they handed me was, please write this Korak story. We need a Korak story for what <laughs> turned out to be the last issue of Tarzan Family. And um, I wrote a decent story. You know, I went back more to the gold key Korak stories. Mm -hmm. because you know the, the stuff that had been dc had been published in this core act really didn't do anything for me but the next thing they had me to do was they handed me two scripts mm -hmm. of a character called the black bomber mm -hmm. these were scripts edited by jerry conway written by bob canager two great guys i should i should tell you that both mm -hmm. are both well bob was a friend mm -hmm. uh during the short time i was at dc jerry's a friend they're good guys. They're right. good guys. They were too close to this idiotic idea they had come up with, which was basically a comic book superhero version of the Watermelon Man. Uh, wow. a movie, <laughs> that's a movie with Godfrey Cambridge. Yeah. Where he's, a, he's this white big who turns into, by the end of the movie, he's a black uh, radical. Mm -hmm. um, and these scripts were terrible. Mm -hmm. um, the Black Bomber was a white bigot who took place took part in camouflage experiments to help him blend into the jungles of Vietnam better. Nothing happened when he was in Vietnam, but when he got back stateside, at times of stress or whatever, he would turn into the Incredible Negro, mm. uh, this, this Black superhero. He did not know that he became a Black superhero. Mm -hmm. The Black superhero did not know he was really a white racist. Mm. In the scripts, they each have girlfriends who witness the transformation and say nothing. Wow. Okay. <laughs> if I'm in that kind of relationship, I'm at least going to ask a question. Yeah. Um, in each of the two scripts, as the white racist, he saves somebody he can't see clearly and is horrified when he discovered he risked his life for a black person. In one case, it's a baby in a baby carriage and I'm dying if I'm lying the exact words he says is he says do you mean I risked my life for a jungle bunny Ooh. 
Ooh, wow. And the final cherry on this shit Sunday, his <laughs> uniform was basically a basketball uniform. Mm. I read these two scripts and I they want me to punch him up <laughs> uh, and start take over the book with the third issue. I say, you can't publish these scripts. He, what do you mean? We paid for them. No, they're horrible. They're the most offensive scripts I've ever read. If you publish these scripts, People will come to your offices with pitchforks and torches. How can you know that, Tony? I will lead them. <laughs> <laughs> this went on for weeks. Mm. And so I finally boiled it down to, do you really want your first headline black superhero to be a white racist? Wow. And they kind of go, oh, yeah, we never thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. By the way, never thinking of that way, that's pretty much a DC corporate policy. <laughs> Um, so anyway, so I have two weeks to create Black Lightning. I create Jefferson Pierce, my idea of a fine role model. Uh, he's an educated man. He's a teacher. Uh, he's an Olympic athlete because, you know, I need those skills for him to fight the mob in Metropolis' suicide slum. I wanted to do inner city stories. That's really where my heart is. I'm a, you know, I'm a lower middle class kid. Um, I don't have that exact experience, but I was adjacent to that experience. Um, and the fact that he was teaching at his old high school, I stole that from Welcome Back, Cotter. <laughs> Statue of Limitations has expired. They can't get me for it, but I stole that from Welcome Back, Cotter. Um, so about an hour before the pitch, pitch meeting, I'm going to pitch it to, to Sal Harrison and Joe Orlando, one of those man, men I consider a great friend and and I mourn his passing to the day. Mm -hmm. The other one was Sal Harrison. Uh, <laughs> so it's an hour before the pitch meeting and it suddenly occurs to me, gosh, you've created everything about Jefferson Pierce. What's his superhero identity? And it's like, <laughs> duh. <laughs> but, look, I'm a comic writer. I think fast upon my feet. I'm wandering around the DC office. I've got about an hour before the meeting. Wandering to Julie Schwartz's office. There's a rough for a Wonder Woman cover. Mm -hmm. uh, Wonder Woman standing on a building or maybe on a robot plane. Lassoing a black lightning bolt and saying something like, Hera, help me stop this black lightning from destroying the city. <laughs> it's the 70s. Black lightning's catchy. Mm -hmm. I'm going, yeah, I can do something with that. <laughs> so in the hour before the pitch meeting, I come up with all, you know, with the identity and the electrical uh, powers and some idea of what he should look like. Right. Um, the costume itself was a gang effort. Myself, Jack Harris, Bob Rosakis, Joe Orlando, and Trevor Von Eden. I know the Captain America boots were mine. And the lightning piping were mine. <laughs> the, the Afro mask was Bob Rosakis. Mm. The, the more open uh, shirt, that was Joe Orlando. Who Joe had this idea that, that young male readers like to see a lot of male skin. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe <laughs> much, well, this is manly and, and kids are into that. Well, it, but it didn't bother me. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a cliche to always have the black characters with, with the cleavage. But right. okay, it wasn't that much of a cliche back then. That was 1976. Mm -hmm. um, they loved the idea. We worked out an agreement. They quickly violated that agreement. Yeah. But again, it's DC Comics. Uh, people ask me, you know, I, you know, there are people at DC I love. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I love a lot of the work I've done for them. I love almost all the work I did for them. I didn't like being on staff for six months. That was hell. But, <laughs> but um, the rest of it, you know, the work part, fine. Mm -hmm. um, but they have a history of not keeping their agreements with me and others. Uh, did Black Lightning. Uh, thought I did a good job. Was pumped to hear that he's going to be on the Super Friends show. Mm -hmm. Then found out, no. I didn't find out until I actually watched the show that they had replaced him with Black Vulcan. Ooh. My, D my deal with DC 
would have required them to pay me, I think it was 10% of whatever they got for Black Lightning. So let's say there were 10 DC characters on that show. I would have gotten 10% of one tenth mm-hmm. of, of, of 10% of 10% of what they got. Not a lot of money. They didn't want to pay it. DC didn't want to pay it. It was their uh, obligation to pay it to me. They told Hanna-Barbera that they had to pay more for Black Lightning. And Hanna-Barbera, also, also notoriously cheap, mm-hmm. said, we'll just steal the character. And DC let him do it. Wow. And so my last <laughs> issue of my first run of Black Lightning, uh, before I quit, had a villain called Barbara Hanna who <laughs> was traveling the country with a phony Black Lightning. Um, and I was amazed I got away with it. Um, I think Joe Orlando knew exactly what I was doing. And and Jack Harris, who's who's a solid citizen, was not going to say, well, should Tony be doing this? No, Jack went went, went, went along with it too. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I left. Mm. Um, I inquired about buying Black Lightning back from DC a little while later, mm-hmm. maybe about a year later. And that's when they retroactively changed the credit line from a solo credit for me, uh, which was what had been agreed upon, to adding Trevor Von Eden to the mm. name, to the to the credits. Mm. I never objected to Trevor getting money for his Black Lightning work, not once. And anybody who says that I ever objected to that part of it, mm-hmm. I objected to the solo credit. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, in the latest agreement I have with them, <laughs> they offered me the solo credit back. Uh, they'll probably deny this, but they told me I could have my solo credit back I knew that meant Trevor would never get another dime from them because mm. they didn't like Trevor any better than they liked me. <laughs> um, but I rewrote the credit line to created by Tony Isabella with Trevor Von Eden because with is real ambiguous. Yeah. But the best description I've heard of this came from Salim Akil, the showrunner and director and writer of the Black Lightning TV show. Mm-hmm. Trevor and I did a cameo as judges. Mm-hmm. And he introduced us to the cast. I mean, the cast already knew me because I'd been around on the set several times. Um, as Tony and Isabel created these characters and Trevor showed us what they looked like. And I'm really okay with that. That that's a good description of it. Uh, and you know, Trevor has continued getting money, and and I've made money off the TV show and a few things. Um Probably not as much as I should be making, <laughs> but you know, it's it's been better money than I've ever seen from DC. You're anticipating all my questions there, but that's oh. okay. Um, well, you come up go, with some go, more. Go, 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 going well, back, 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 back. Okay, so before you even worked for Marvel, I mean, I, I'm I have like ten questions in my head. So before, okay, you were a, weren't you like a letter hack for a while? Oh my god, yeah, yeah. that's what I thought. You know, yes, because I think uh, I remember seeing you in the letters column like frequently, okay. even. At least- at least yeah. 50 published letters. Yeah, yeah. Okay. In fact, if I can ever figure out and get copies of all the letters <laughs> that I've written to comic book companies, I will collect them into a book. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and but yes, there were a lot of them. And is that how you became friends with people like Roy yeah, Thomas and stuff Roy like that? Thomas, Just seeing your uh, name over and over and saying, yeah. I, I was I was corresponding with Roy Thomas, with Steve Englehart. Uh, of course, you know, working on fanzines, which came as a result of um you know the letters they see your letter i mark evanier has been one of my closest friends for half a century mm-hmm. um gene simmons used to write for the same uh fan scenes i did mm-hmm. and uh one time when he kiss was in cleveland uh and they wanted to interview gene and he said could we interview me at my friend's comic book shop mm-hmm. so you know after the store closed you know, I set up the shop to show lots of, I think, I think the Kiss Marvel book was out by that time. Mm. And uh, very surreal thing for me. Uh, I'm sitting there talking with Gene Simmons, who would already be a foot taller than me without mm. the whole Kiss gear. He's yeah. in full Kiss gear. Mm. And we're sitting there talking about who are our favorite Jack Kirby anchors. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so good times mm-hmm. but yeah dave cockram 
Mm -hmm. uh, and I met through the fanzines, Klaus Janssen, uh, Dwight Decker, uh, God, probably so many people. Um, and some, and when I started at Marvel, of course, I brought some, I mean, I hired Tom Orzakowski, who turned <laughs> out to be one of the best letterers ever. Mm. Um, so, so that was a, you know, that was a case where, you know, my fandom connections came in handy, mm -hmm. useful, whatever. Right. And, you know, it's no problem doing that. If somebody's good, you know, why not yeah. recommend him? So yeah. <laughs> I met Tom before. He's a very good guy. So <laughs> um, on all these different characters, I mean, I know from what you're saying, you know, trying to do something more diverse, trying to be, bring in characters of color and everything like that. Uh, you mentioned a little bit uh, of this, but I was just wondering if there's any pushback other than you giving pushback to that original script um you know initially well first you have to understand before there were comic shops yeah. publishing comic books with a black lead or even a black in a prominent position was risky mm -hmm. uh dell did this western comic called lobo right which i thought was a pretty good comic it only lasted two issues because distributors down south would not distribute it and indeed, some of them wouldn't distribute any of the Dell comics. Mm. So, you know, Dell ended up canceling the comic. Every time pre-comic shops, a company did a comic with a black lead, uh, they were taking a risk. Mm. So, you know, the comics industry has its faults, but that's something commendable. Once the comic shops came in, right. it was never a problem again. Mm -hmm. you know the only you know if, if if a comic book didn't sell it wasn't because it wasn't out there it was because it probably wasn't a good enough comic mm -hmm. or the market wasn't right for it but no i i never really got any pushback um mm -hmm. in later years there were people saying well why is he called black lightning <laughs> well because he's proud of who he is yeah um and and there's been a little bit of pushback from people who recently not much one or two he was created by a white guy. There were no <laughs> black writers in the only black writers in comics yep. that I was aware of in 1976 were basically Billy Graham, mm -hmm. um, who did some writing for Warren, you know, on stories he, he drew himself. Um, that was pretty much it, Billy Graham. Yeah. We didn't start getting in, you know, uh, Christopher Priest, who was then Jim Owsley, or mm -hmm. Dwayne McNuffie. Dwayne McDuffie until late 70s, early 80s. Right. So in 76, you know, that was me. You know, right. that's who you're going to get. Yeah. And I read that book, unfortunately, it, it, that uh, I don't have it in front of me, so I don't remember the name of it, but I interviewed the author of it. Uh, Ken Quattro is his name yes, uh yes, yes. And, uh, his book if you have it there hold it up but I don't have it in front of me but I don't you know have, he I can't you know, find in, ta in, ta <laughs> in talking with him on this very podcast he was saying that yeah uh it was kind of like women in World War II once the troops started coming home all the black uh artists and writers were kicked off the staff and they brought in all the white ones again you know yeah. and it was just kind of what happened back then and so and then they didn't start hiring again till the time period you're saying you right. know so uh kind of ironic i never really thought about it is uh, you and tony tallarico are both italian descent correct so yeah. you know it's like interesting you know and joe orlando like, again, yeah, another yeah. Time was a big booster black lightning probably yeah. the biggest booster among the corporate types there yeah uh we did that now at marvel we did uh we were hiring young black artists yeah i worked with i i gave early assignments to or worked with you know arvel jones uh mm -hmm. keith pollard uh ron wilson uh you know so so we were you know we were open to them uh we were bringing them in i mean rich buckler <laughs> i mean arvel jones and keith Pollard are both people that rich buckler brought into the business mm -hmm. ron had been there I think before I got there, right, working with John Romita. So, I, since I had a brain fart on this, I'll just say it. Yeah, Quinn Quattro's book, Invisible Men. That's you know, yes. and it's like there's there's yes. the picture. It's a, yeah, it's a great and, book. Didn't it win an yeah. award? 
Yes, it did win an Eisner Award, and that was yeah. around the time. I actually interviewed him right after he had won it, and so oh, he, okay. he held it up. So if you look on YouTube and look up that episode, he had well, it. So. Well deserved. It's a terrific book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we discussed, you know, other possible people that weren't covered in the first book because, you know, there's a couple that worked at Harvey and Archie and stuff yeah. like that, that, you know, because mm -hmm. everybody always seems to focus on the big two, of course, but you know, it's like, um, but, you know, yeah, most of, you know, the, the ironic thing is that we said since they were kind of progressive in the 50s is that EC never had a black artist or writer. Yeah. And it's just kind of interesting that way. And uh, Ken did say that uh, Al Feldstein um, said, yeah, he should have got Matt Murphy or something, you know, to to be on staff at some yeah. point. But anyway, um, back to you. <laughs> um so uh what was i saying about this right now um so on the tv series of black uh wait tv series was black lightning or the tv yeah the, I, I got my notes also it, that was the movie so black goliath did it ever appear in the movies is not, black goliath as or just black as goliath. bill foster bill foster okay. um, so what's the story Mar in that Marvel, i'm a little confused about how it is now See, Marvel, when you were doing it i understood it so. yeah i don't don't ask me what's happening currently because yeah. i really you know i i basically read marvels in trade now yeah and as long as i don't think about how those trades fit into the rest of the universe i can <laughs> enjoy them mm -hmm. um my wife and I attended the world premiere of Ant-Man and the Wasp because mm -hmm. of Bill Foster being in there, even though I didn't create him. Um, and at the after party, uh, I met Lawrence Fishburne, who's a mm -hmm. comics fan. And, and he said that there was a scene written at one point that a flashback that would have shown Bill Foster growing up, going to giant size. So I'm, hopefully they didn't call him Black Goliath. Uh, but um, but yeah, no, he was hoping that Bill Foster would come back and get to grow to giant size. Mm. Um, and I guess that's what my question really was because you know I've seen most of the Marvel uh, movies, and that one, you know, the the Ant Man and the Wasp kind of leaves you hanging. It like they didn't really go further with the story yet. I mean, I'm sure there's another movie there's somewhere. A, there's a sequel coming up. Yeah, so uh -huh. I don't know, but if that would like. Would they put I, I Black, Black Goliath in that, or that's part I'm not done. sure Lawrence is in is in okay. the in okay movie. okay. Um, the most I will tell you the most fun thing about the after party. I mean, it was great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I talked to Paul Rudd and and complimented him on the writing, which you know because he was one of the writers. Mm -hmm. and his face lit up. Nobody mm -hmm. ever talks to this guy about his writing. Yeah. Uh, but I met Michael Douglas, right, who was right. my wife's girlhood crush because she used to see him on streets the same yeah. <laughs> so i waved barb over and said michael i want you to meet my my wife barb uh she she had a crush on you from watching you on the streets of san francisco <laughs> michael takes her by the hands looks deep into her eyes and goes Oh my dear, you're much too young to have seen me in that. <laughs> and I'm thinking two things. One, this is how he gets Catherine Zeta Jones. Yes, exactly. And two, <laughs> is Barb coming back to Ohio with me? <laughs> Fortunately, she did come back to Ohio with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, you, every 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 person I've met, Marvel or DC, who's a who's appeared on these shows, has really been great. You know, mm -hmm. fun to talk to, friendly. Mm -hmm. uh i think they appreciate being part of this vast of these vast universes uh, mm -hmm. they they enjoy the built-in fandom mm -hmm. and it's not lost on them that should their careers go soft right they can go to conventions as often as they want and make thousands of dollars signing autographs so mm -hmm. yeah they're pretty happy to be part of these movies mm -hmm. Now you said you were around the going back to the other one, Black Lightning. You said you're around and you appeared in one episode as Judge Isabella. Yes. <laughs> Creative name. Uh, and uh you were around the set and everything. How did it transpire that they would create a series for Black Lightning? That's we we owe 
the Isabella family personally and Black Lightning fans owe a tremendous debt to Jeff Johns. Hmm. Jeff Johns, who's been a big fan of my work and become a good friend, Jeff wanted to do a Black Lightning series. Nobody else at DC was really interested in that. Yeah. They, they disrespected Black Lightning almost from day one. Um, but Jeff loves the character, loved my work on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Isabella family part is because Jeff wasn't going to push this series unless I had a better agreement in place. Mm -hmm. So thanks to Jeff Johns, a better create agreement was crafted. Not perfect, mm -hmm. but better. And DC is better about adhering to it, at least the letter of it. Um, from good. there, Jeff asked me to write a core values paper for Black Lightning, mm -hmm. which I did, and which was the starting point for the TV series. Mm -hmm. When Salim and Mara Brock Akil, the brilliant Salim and Mara Brock Akil, were hired as showrunners, uh, we had hours of conference calls uh, where they asked me more questions than, than I can remember. Uh, they really wanted my thoughts on everything concerning Black Lightning. And they even flew me to Burbank to spend a day with the writers hmm. before the writers started their work. And that was a thrill in itself because, you know, on one wall, there's like a rough mock-up of the 13, of the first season, 13 episodes. Hmm. And I'm looking at it and, whoa, there's a lot of me in there. <laughs> uh, on the other side of the writer's room, was uh, photos, pictures, and list of characters that they could use. And a bunch of those were mine. Hmm. Um, I wish I could have taken pictures of those walls, but that was prohibited. Um, <laughs> because two characters were supposed to die in that first season that didn't. <laughs> Peter Gamby and Tobias Whale. Mm -hmm. But when you have great actors playing those characters you don't want to kill them off right <laughs> um so from there i mean i i there was a black lightning premiere on martin luther king weekend in washington dc mm -hmm. i pretty much internet shamed dc and in inviting me because i was not on the <laughs> guest list um <laughs> a lot of that is a lot of me getting there is due to larry ganam a very good person at dc uh, so I did get to go to the to the premiere. Mm -hmm. There was an event before that. Um, I got to meet the entire cast for the first time. Um, the only photo op or whatever was they had me go through this line getting their autographs on a poster that had been created for um, the event. They had panels. They had a panel on Black Lightning. I watched it from the audience. Wasn't even, you know, uh, but, you know, again, later on, there was a San Diego panel and I wasn't even acknowledged from, oh. from the moderator of the panel. They had acknowledged a writer on the Supergirl show mm -hmm. who was in the audience during that presentation. But there I am sitting in the, in the audience and didn't get a mention. Wow. But the cast itself couldn't be nicer at the after party of the premiere god i spent a lot of time with um with uh, the the actress who plays um i'm blanking on this i can't believe i'm blanking on this because she's a dear friend go oh, christine adams oh, okay. who plays lynn stewart we we bonded i spent time talking mm -hmm. to to uh pretty much all the cast members that were there mm -hmm. um and then after that, I mean, I think it was around the first season. Things had already gone bad between me and DC in terms of the comic book writing. <laughs> uh, they decided that Black Lightning was best suited to be Batman's house Negro in <laughs> Batman and the Outsiders. Wow. I know you cringed when I said that. That's the term that's used. Neil Adams cringed when I said it. But <laughs> you know, they had Black, Light Black Lightning cares... Jefferson Pierce cares about three things above all else, his family, his students, and his community. Mm. And this Batman and the Outsiders travesty that they did, <laughs> have him leave all that, go to Gotham, 
<clears throat> live in an apartment paid by paid for by Bruce Wayne to do Batman's bidding on Batman's missions. I always wow. imagined that off panel, Bruce Wayne would leave the money on the and the end table whenever he visited Jefferson Pierce. <laughs> the book was stupid. Almost everything they've done with the Black Lightning since then has been stupid. Mike Barr crafted an adult relationship, a friend relationship between Katana and, and Jefferson mm -hmm. and the boneheads of DC editorial and the writers they hired thought, well, they should be romantically involved. It, the easy way out. At one point, Black Lightning became living lightning, living in Katana's sword. So he wasn't even the most human DC hero of all, and he wasn't even human. Wow. <laughs> I don't know what they've done with him since. I don't even know one, all those stories. <laughs> the one thing I do love was John Ridley's The Other History of the DC Universe. Mm -hmm. Not exactly what I would have done, but yeah. brilliant and faithful and respectful. And to find out that it was my writing on Black Lightning in the 70s that mm -hmm. made John Ridley want to become a writer. I mean, I got an Oscar-winning author in my corner, <laughs> uh, screenwriter in my corner. Mm -hmm. And uh, John's been very good about mentioning this in reviews. Mm -hmm. So I do, you know, as far as Black Lightning things I like that I didn't write, Other History of the DC Universe is top of the list. Okay. Um, but by the second season, it became obvious to me from communicating with the cast and crew of Black Lightning that it didn't matter what DC thought of me. I was always welcome on that set. That's good. So I was at the second season wrap party and then stayed over a few days to visit the set mm -hmm. where, I mean, everybody, you know, I was asked to speak at the wrap party. People were coming up to me, thanking me for their jobs. Um, just a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, I got to see uh, the, um, the whole they had two buildings in Decatur, Georgia, and everybody was glad to see me there. Um, the construction, you know, they they had told people in advance that yeah, Tony Isabel is going to be visiting us for a few days, mm -hmm. and like the construction crew guy, chief came out to me while I was wandering a lot and say, "Would you come into the construction area? Some of my guys brought comics that they'd like you to sign." Um, cool. And so I visited. <coughs> You know, I visited then. I visited a couple of times during the third season mm -hmm. um, and did the cameo in the third season. Right. Um, with Trevor on Eden was one of the judges and Jennifer Krista Palmer, who was the only professional among the judges, mm -hmm. was, was the main judge. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I did OK. Uh, <laughs> I, I remembered all my lines. I think Trevor was a better actor. <laughs> but I, think I I knew my lines better. Yeah. Um, and I'd like actually I'd like to do more acting. Uh, I've cool. done I've done a few bits and pieces here locally, <laughs> um, but I'd really like to do more acting. And I keep bugging Jeff Johns, saying that you know, the Golden Age Adam hasn't appeared on Star Girl yet. I'm short enough to pl play. You know, I I can play an <laughs> Al Pratt who isn't quite in in superhero you know physique anymore so so anybody listening bug jeff johns tell him you want to see tony isabella playing al pratt on star girl <laughs> that's cool <laughs> now um another thing and i'm sure you were asked this at the time and then everybody's forgot about it i forgot about it but then i saw it recently um the TV series of Black Lightning wasn't the first time there was a live action Black Goliath, <laughs> Black Lightning, excuse me. It was oh. on Saturday Night Live and Saturday it was Sinbad back when they did Superman's funeral and they did like every costume character from both Marvel and DC in that. And I saw it again recently and I go, oh my God, they did do Black Lightning on there. Oh, my God, I was on the floor. <laughs> did you know that they were going to do that in advance? I did, not know, oh, okay. I did not know that in advance because why would D, you know, first off, they wouldn't have had to tell DC. Yeah. That's parody. But right. even if they had, DC wouldn't have told me. Well, I thought maybe because they rehearsed during the week, you know, it might have no, leaked no, out to you I, or something. I didn't you know, know about hey, it Tony, guess until what? <laughs> I, I had recorded it. Yeah. 
but I hadn't watched it. And it wasn't until Peter David posted something in line said, oh, my God, I hope Tony Isabel watched Saturday Night Live. <laughs> so I didn't watch it. Sinbad called me up a little bit later. Uh -huh. and, and we had a mutual admiration thing going on. Um, we It was years before we met face to face. He's a big comics fan. Mm -hmm. um, he was doing a show in Cleveland and invited me as his, you know, he said, I, you know, I'm doing a show in Cleveland. Are you coming? I said, you're sold out. We're never sold out. I have tickets. Just pick them up at the counter. Wow. <laughs> so I went to the show, picked them up. I got the third degree. Well, how do you know Mr. Sinbad? <laughs> Who calls him Mr. Sinbad? I go, well, um, we're friends. How? I said, he's a comics fan. I created Black Lightning, who he played in a skit in Saturday Night Live. And, and we've talked on the phone many times and we've never met. And so he invited me to this show so that I could meet him and I should really get down there because he wanted to chat with me before his show. So they, they let me in. Uh -huh. It never got filtered down to them that oh. I was there oh. because I was supposed to be brought backstage to talk to him before his show. I did see him after the show. Um, and, and basically w when he came in, there was about my, there was myself and about eight other people, the other people having paid extra for their, their time with Sinbad. He sees me and he runs, he literally runes over to me and hugs me. I'm very yeah. hungry. <laughs> and, and so we spent like 20 minutes talking comics mm -hmm. and he twittered about, this is Tony Isabel. He's the most, most woke writer in comics. And <laughs> uh, it was terrific. You know, and I, I left after about, 15 20 minutes because really the other people had paid for time with Sid Man. <laughs> and it was getting late and I had a long ride home. Speaking of being huggable, on uh, when I visited the Black Lightning set, China Mc, Ch Ch China McLean um was um in doing a scene where her and her father are fighting Tobias Whale. She's in her costume for I think the first or second time in the series. She comes out of the scene because it was a the office set was built it was one of the standing sets there she comes out sees me squeals literally squeals and runs over to hug me <laughs> notices that i have a pops barbershop shop shirt on from luke cage he's going did you work on luke cage i said well i created misty knight and she mm. goes you created black lightning and misty knight <laughs> you're the coolest man ever <laughs> sweetheart of a, of a young lady uh immensely talented mm -hmm. uh and again that was the kind of that's how i was treated by by everyone on the cast i mean i i always felt loved and respected mm -hmm. now apart from the characters you created i mean you worked on various different other series over the um i could name some but i was just kind of curious which one you enjoyed working on best that might not have been your own creation um let's see well at marvel i enjoyed writing ghost rider mm -hmm. uh, i took it in a different direction gary friedrich had it because gary knew motorcycles and and that kind of backwoods type stuff and i didn't <laughs> so so you know it was a plan it was planned for me to transition it more to a superhero book um i was planning to basically do my version of simon and kirby stuntman mm um and that went along well for you know two two years um i brought jesus christ or a character very much like jesus christ into the series <laughs> uh because you know it, in marvel speak basically the way my the way a certain issue was supposed to end was um that johnny blaze was basically going to accept jesus christ as his lord and savior and be saved from satan forever Mm -hmm. uh, but it was in Marvel speak. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the idea was that from there, we weren't going to go full tilt religious comics. <laughs> You'd see Johnny going to church. He'd be a little bit more of a white hat hero. Um, you know, I thought it'd be really cool to have this white hat hero in evil Hollywood. 
And that's what I planned to do had I not left Marvel. Mm. Of course, despite, you know, during the chaos that was Marvel, um, a, an assistant editor decided he was offended by the use of Jesus Christ in the comic. Mm. And that assistant editor took it upon himself to pull the book back mm. before it went out to, to, to be printed um, and have two or three pages redrawn to make the Jesus Christ figure a demon in disguise. That makes absolutely no sense yeah. <laughs> if you had read the rest of the issues. And I've been explaining that to, to Christian readers, of which I have quite a few, despite my being a despicable heathen, um, have asked me, you know, why did you do that? And I go, I didn't. Here's where my story ended. Um, <laughs> But it was the chaos of Marvel at that time. One of the reasons I, I went over to DC. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I enjoyed Ghost Rider. Uh, I was enjoying Daredevil, but two of the editors wanted to write Daredevil themselves. Mm -hmm. So I was shifted over to Captain America, mm -hmm. figuring, okay, well, I like Captain America too. And then I found out, you know, I had come up with a big year-long bicentennial storyline only to find out that Jack Kirby was coming back and getting the book, something the editors were aware of when they switched me to it. Oh, wow. So it was like, I mean, that's comics. That's comics. Yeah. Um, I, I ended up, you know, I was good friends with those editors before that. We, we got back to that point after that. <laughs> um, you know, but it's just comics. But I enjoyed, you know, Captain America. I didn't have much more to do than try to minimize Steve Englehart's idiocy and screwing up the Falcon. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, there were, you know, I enjoyed writing the black and white horror stories. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them, I think, are the best work I did. War Toy with George Perez. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Drifting Snow and August Derleth. Uh, adaptation drawn by Esteban Moroto, mm -hmm. Light of Other Days by Bob Shaw, which I adapted and, and which Gene Colan drew. Mm -hmm. um, boy, a couple of Dracula stories drawn by by like Gene Colan and uh, John Buscema. So I, I enjoyed working. I enjoyed working on the black and white horror magazines as a writer and an editor. And it's the kind of thing that if I were offered a chance to edit something like that again, I jump at it because I think yeah. I'd be better at it. Yeah, um, I miss those Marvel black and white magazines. <clears throat> Not just you know, crazy. I, li I like all of, of them. I like Tales of the Zombie. I like yep. uh, um, uh, what's the other one? <laughs> Monsters, Monsters and Unleashed. Unleashed. Yeah, uh, uh, and the Wars Dracula of one, of course. Yeah, Dracula yeah. lives. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm you know I mean that was early work. For, I was the guy who hired Bill Matlo to write for the, mm -hmm. I was the first guy who gave Bill writing opportunities. Mm -hmm. I gave uh, apparently first assignments to Pat Broderick and, and Bob McLeod. Mm. Uh, I hired Chris Claremont to be my assistant editor, mm. <laughs> uh, which I think worked out well for everyone. Yeah. Uh, so no, I had a really good time at Marvel. I made some really good friends. Mm -hmm. uh, most, a lot of whom are gone now, but mm. no, I enjoyed that. And at DC, I loved writing Hawkman. Um mm -hmm. My unfortunately, my five year plan for Hawkman was deep six by Denny O'Neill, um, <laughs> who, who, having spent something like two years having Tony Stark drunken in the gutter in Iron Man, decided that it was impertinent of me to have a five year plan for Hawkman that would at some point involve other DC comics. Mm. And so, wanted me to wrap it up in two issues, mm. and which is why I left Hawkman. Uh, and so he let John Byrne wrap it up in an issue of Action Comics, wherein apparently the Thanagarians had a button on their ships that would cause all their ships to go into a black hole or something. It was stupid. <laughs> but, you know, by that time, and, and of course, a couple of my ideas for Hawkman somehow ended up in other DC books later on. Yeah, I was going to ask, oh, yeah, what happens if you have a five-year plan and then it gets cut off? What do you do with well, that material? Because um, you have the, the ideas. Can and, you retool them? 
not really. Those were very Hawkman oh, and okay. DC Universe specific. There are other things that I can retool. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of Hawkman, the notable ones are the explanation of why Commissioner Emmett's brain could not be read by the Thanagarians. Mm. And it was because he had been plunged into an icy stream in Korea. Mm. And part of his brain was dead. And it was the part of the brain that the, the Absorbiscon works on. <laughs> uh, later on, mm. the question written by, oh, what was the guy's name? Oh, Denny O'Neill mm -hmm. had a similar thing. Plunged in an icy stream, hypothermia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, original. Uh, <laughs> and of course, the Invasion miniseries was basically one of the uh, one of the things I had planned for Hawkman. You know, there mm -hmm. would have come a time when Hawkman could recruit allies, allies in the Shadow War against Thanagarian, Thanagar, and for a month or two, that would be the focus of the Hawkman comic. And of course, any other DC writer that wanted to tie into it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something where they had to. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that didn't happen. So instead, mm -hmm. a few years, a year or so later, DC did the invasion. <laughs> so... Yeah. Now, apart from the big two, you've worked for other companies. Uh, yes. Um, you, didn't you do a little even for Archie at one point? I never worked for Archie. Oh, and it's one of the did. great re re regrets of my life oh. because I'm a huge fan of Frank Doyle. Yeah. I thought Frank Doyle was the Neil Simon of comics. <laughs> five, these five page comedies with sparkling writing and great punchlines. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I love George Gladier's work. Mm -hmm. Well, and George and I were friends. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, when I was writing 1,000 comic books you must read, George sent me some very rare comic books hmm. for that. Um, so I never worked for Archie. That's a regret. Um, I know you worked for Comico because you worked on Justice Machine. and Comico, uh, yes. Comico. Um, I, 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 I never I, knew I, how it was pronounced. <laughs> they never had. <laughs> anyway. Mike, Mike Gustavich asked me to write Justice Machine. I was the uh -huh. second choice after Roy Thomas. Mm -hmm. And and Mike lived near me, and so the idea would be that we would do we would Lee and Kirby this up. Mm -hmm. We'd get together, we'd work out the stories. Mike would draw them, I would script them, uh, and it turned out that Mike would draw them. I was not happy with the artwork. I won't mm -hmm. elaborate. Uh, and after a while, it it just. I just couldn't work with the stuff anymore. The Justice Machine was a shaky idea from the start. Uh, from its creation, it never made a whole lot of sense. Mm -hmm. I managed to overcome that to some extent with just the force of the writing. You know, good stories, good character play, good dialogue. Um, but it could have been better. Mm -hmm. uh, it would have been better. I, I really felt Mike was phoning it in from the start. Um, and you know actually i own my justice machine stories mm. i was never asked to sign away any rights oh, so cool. anybody wanting to reprint the justice machine <laughs> stuff they need to contact me because they don't own i mean they could publish the blank pages without any script <laughs> but they can't publish the scripts <laughs> or if they want to make a movie of it contact this guy <laughs> yeah, i can't imagine anybody would make a movie um let's see what i wrote i wrote the grim ghost okay which i was really happy with um kelly jones and i thought did great work i think it was best of those the best of those atlas revivals and that despite the editorial and operational stuff being shaky i quit the book a couple of times mm -hmm. because they they like say well we got together and we have some notes i go what do you mean we and it was like oh all the people hanging around the office and the janitor and whoever else mm -hmm. i said no you know kelly and i have almost 100 years of experience between us we know how <laughs> to do this we have it you give us one editor we'll listen to him and eventually they gave up they gave up trying to to do that they let me do pretty much what i wanted to do mm -hmm. kelly did it brilliantly um and then atlas went under because two things 
Uh, it wasn't the best management of the company mm -hmm. and also the DC new universe mm -hmm. hit that summer. Yeah. Um, we had, Kelly and I got the book out on time. All of our issues would have shipped on time, except in their new universe frenzy, Diamond like just left the last issue of Grim Ghost sitting in the warehouse. Wow. And ended up having to re <laughs> ended up having to resolicit it. Wow. But if people can get a hold of those copies, the six issues, uh, and it won't be easy because <laughs> a lot of the stuff back issue stock was destroyed in a flood. <clears throat> um it was in the publisher's basement. Um, but they're pretty good stories. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, in fact, I actually tried to buy Grim Ghost at one point and, um, you know, figuring, okay, here's, here's a comic that has failed twice <laughs> from a company that has failed twice. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, I had somebody who was willing to work with me on trying to turn it into a TV series. Mm. Um, unfortunately, I never got the rights, mm -hmm. so I couldn't continue the series or reprint the stories that had been done hmm. or develop a TV series before Sleepy Hollow came out. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Those are the breaks. Uh. Yeah, it, 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 it's entertainment. It's entertainment as comics. Those are the breaks. Yeah. Um, I look back at a 50-year career and I'm more happy with what I did than, than more unhappy. Yeah. Uh, I wish certain things had gone better, mm -hmm. uh, but I got to meet and work with a lot of great people and I'm still meeting and, and having fun today, uh, going to these conventions, doing, I mean, I'm the go-to guy for comic book news stories in, right. in the Cleveland area. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I had just gotten back from a convention when Stan Lee pair died mm -hmm. and I hadn't even unpacked when a TV station called and said, do you have a clean suit? Could you get down to our station in an hour and a half so we can put you live on the air? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I did it. I'm a pro. <laughs> right. <laughs> you have now, a cute dog back there. Is that a dog or a cat? Uh, there's a dog back there. Yeah, that's my dog. There's two dogs. It's Lulu and uh, Mia. They 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 try to make cameo appearances whenever you well, do I a just, podcast. I just so, saw the second yeah. one. <laughs> I'm surprised she hasn't. Neither of them have tried to jump on my lap, but sometimes I do. They have been here. I've been petting her discreetly down below the best <laughs> i can do is a dr fauci bobble <laughs> dr fauci that's my great. cat knows better than to try to jump on the desk um, doing one of these a few more things uh these are just totally random things so we're going to jump okay. around a little bit so um also you've done a lot of writing and you know i was always impressed you know i was a subscriber to comic buyers guide for many years and you had your tony's tips column yeah. are you still doing that it said that like it was in tales of wonder so is that still being published uh, not or? anymore uh okay. right now there's okay. a blog called tony isabel's bloggy thing okay that for a long time was daily mm -hmm. uh now it, it it's not been daily for a long time i i try to get at least a couple out a week i don't always manage that mm -hmm. but there's tony isabel's bloggy thing that still runs okay um once or twice a week, you can find me writing gags for John Lustig's Last Kiss. Oh, okay. Panel. Yeah, he's a good friend. He's a good, he's a <laughs> I good need to have guy. him on here, too. I haven't done that yet. <laughs> you should get him on there. He's, yeah. he's a funny guy. And, yeah. and we, we're both twisted. Yes. <laughs> we're, we're both incredibly <laughs> twisted. And so it's a team that works. Well. I actually, just as an aside, um, he did a contest once. I mean, you might have done it more than once, but I won one of them where he had a blank like page from one of the old romance comics. Yeah. And you just had to fill in what the balloon said. And uh, he ran it as I a did, Oh, John did that. John did this. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> um, you, you, the, the, you were supposed to fill out the, the balloons and whoever won, you got the original, not the original art, but I mean, the original print or something like right. that signed by John. And I actually won once, you know, I don't know if he's done it more than once. So, you know, I have this frame thing. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly what the strip was about, but it, the original drawings had like a woman and a man, the woman's like 
trying to get on a bus and she keeps hitting the guy in the eye with those like umbrella and all sorts of weird things and it's supposed to be straight you know originally but i made it so you know that her clumsiness actually was what he was attracted to or something like that but he, you know john loved it and you know so i won <laughs> you know, I, I might have get got a little money for it too i don't even remember 25 bucks or something I don't know. <laughs> but since you said john lost it could just remind me of that mm -hmm. out of the blue um, when did you start Tony's Tips? I don't even remember when it started. I remember more when it ended because I was disappointed that it ended. <laughs> well, Tony's Tips, you know, ended when Comics Buyer's Guide ended. Yeah. Um, I was amazed that they didn't let us go one more issue so we could have hit 700. Right. But by that time, Krause had been sold to, I think it was LNK uh, Publications, maybe. Yeah. And, and they were a crap company. They were a crap company, and uh, I remember one thousand comic books you you must read. Yeah, uh, was yes. their best selling book on comics. I have it right here, there, there it <laughs> and and I could not have done that book without Maggie Thompson and Brent Frankenhoff, which were just mm -hmm. they were just tremendously helpful on that. Mm -hmm. uh, Maggie pretty much pushed. The book through in terms of <laughs> making sure i made the deadlines and everything mm -hmm. um it was selling well it went it sold through a first printing and sold through a second printing mm -hmm. uh when we pitched the idea of a sequel we will tell we were told well it won't sell as well as the first one did and it's like <laughs> so it'll be your second best selling book on comics ever <laughs> He was an idiot. The, 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 the publisher at that time was an idiot. Um, and, you know, I know people miss Comics Buyers Guide. I certainly do. I do. Yeah. Uh, but I made lifelong friends there. I mean, Don and Maggie Thompson were already friends. Yeah. Uh, Brent Frankenhoff, John Jackson Miller, mm -hmm. uh, good people. They had a great cast of writers and everything and artists. Um, I don't remember when I first started doing that. Well, how, uh, let's ask this. How did you get started doing it? Well, the, I mean, actually, the first thing I did, it was back when it was the Comics Buyer's Guide for Comics Fandom. Mm -hmm. I volunteered to write columns for Alan Light. Oh, okay. And I did about three of them under, I think they were called the Odd Collectors. Mm -hmm. uh, theoretically co-written by myself and Dwight Decker, although Dwight didn't do that much of the writing on it. Um and when I got hired at Marvel, I couldn't do it anymore. I knew I couldn't do it anymore. So I actually recommended Don and Maggie Thompson as my replacement. Now, I'm not sure their stuff might have appeared before mine did. Hmm. Uh, probably because Maggie sent it in a form that was easier to publish. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, I, I predated them in some ways. I'm not sure if I actually predated them in terms of actual publication. Uh, and when they became the editors of the magazine, they asked me to write for them. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I was doing the Ever True cartoons. Um, I was doing Tony's Tips. I was doing something called I Cover the Newsstand, I think <laughs> under an alias. Uh, I know there was some stuff I was writing under the name Brad Silver. Um, and so I was, you know, so I was writing for, for their magazine quite a bit. And then when it went from tablet from weekly to monthly, I was one of the writers they kept on. Right. But yeah, I, I, Maggie, Maggie Thompson or John Jackson Miller could probably tell you when I started doing Tony's tips as, as it was known for most of its life. Right. But yeah, I, I loved your column. I think I was mentioned in there once or twice. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. But I know that, you know, so now we're, we're shifting over to the thousand comics you must yes. read. I know I helped you because you put my name in the acknowledgments. It probably doesn't yes. show up here clearly, yes. but I'm up there. <laughs> and it was probably with some Harvey stuff, um, which leads me to believe, I th it leads me to ask, um, d well, you never worked for Harvey. I know that. But no. I mean, did when you grew up, were you reading like everything and anything? Uh, including harvey's and archie's and gold key or dell um, i guess and I, I would read that stuff you know my my main per, per purchases were always you know dc comics once the marvel super once i got introduced to the marvel superhero comics 
uh, them, of course, over at Charlton, Gorgo, and uh, <laughs> Conga, and Reptilicus. Um, I, the Phantom, I know I read it, Gold Key, and Dr. Solar, and Magnus. Mm-hmm. Um, wasn't buying any Archies or Harveys regularly, but, you know, I'd read them at the barber shop. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, if I had some extra money and, and there was nothing else of the titles I would normally buy there, I might pick up an Archie or a Harvey. Okay. Um, it was when I, after college, which I, I only lasted about less than a year in college before I, you know, I had a creative writing teacher who basically told me, don't come into my class anymore. I can't teach you anything. Just drop <laughs> off your work. Um, so that was fine so i decided well look that was the one class i was interested in why am i still in college i'll go and get a job and that's when i ended up working for the cleveland plain dealer as a copy uh, assistant Mm -hmm. Uh, and i did some writing for the paper as well but by that time you know i was a single guy alone even after getting my own apartment i had plenty of money for comics so at that point since i still wanted to get into comics i bought everything Oh wow! <laughs> all the, it's been about 1971, 72. I bought every Archie, Harvey, Charlton. Mm-hmm. Go, I mean, it was a. I had a. I had a store that yeah. I would go to, um, a mom and pop shop uh, that had the best selection of comics, and they would put aside one of every comic for me. Hmm. So I was reading every kind of comic there was. Oh wow. Well, that makes you more qualified for the thousand comic books, I guess, since you had, you know, I always knew that uh, on the Harvey stuff, you were always encouraging of me when I used to publish my Harveyville fun times. So there's some great characters. Uh, Yeah. yeah, So (laughs) maybe, you know, I, of course, I look at them and I go, these characters have problems. (laughs) Um, Well, you've seen uh, uh, Playful Obsession by uh, oh uh, Dan. why can't I Dan Klaus, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give you my favorite Richie Rich story. Okay. Because I had a comic book shop in downtown Cleveland, which meant I was getting downtown workers, I was getting east side workers, uh, west side workers, um, and a lot of black women, you know, middle-aged black women mm-hmm. would come into my store and buy comic books. And their favorite character was Richie Rich. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Now, if there was a whiter character in comics, <laughs> I'd be hard pressed to name him. Uh, so finally, my curiosity got the best of me, and I asked one of the one of the customers. Said, "Okay," said, "Not to look a gift for us in the mouth. You really like Richie Rich. He's really, really white. Can you explain this to me?" And she laughed, and she says, "Well, okay. You got to understand. We totally get the abs- absurd money jokes." Right. You know, the over the top wealth. We get that. That's mm-hmm. funny. We love Richie because that doesn't mean anything to Richie. What mm-hmm. matters to Richie are his friends and his family. And that's us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's true. Um, it is kind of as an aside, you know, along the lines of you having black superheroes, they had like a, an early black character called Tiny that Sid Jacobson yeah. created. He was kind of like in more of the little Audrey books and stuff yeah. like that. So, you know, along the same vein, it's kind of uh, pretty cool that they did that. <laughs> In the 70s, they had this other character named Han and his sister, also in Little Audrey, but it didn't last very long. Anyway, you may or may not know all that, but it doesn't matter. I'm I'm still obsessive I, about I rem- Harvey. I remember, <laughs> I remember Tiny. I remember yeah. Tiny. Yeah. Uh, a couple other things. You had your own comic store, you said. And how long did that last? Just It was called Cosmic uh, Comics. <laughs> Cosmic Comics. Um, yeah. I bought it in early 1977 mm. and it closed in 1989 i want to say mm. now were you actually behind the counter or do you just own it i was behind the counter a lot mm-hmm. um i always had trouble getting good help uh, <laughs> i was a terrible businessman my, my oh. <laughs> most of my workers stole from me Ooh. um and, you know, the best part about it was like all these boxes and stuff would come in and they were all mine. Mm-hmm. At least until I sold them. 
-hmm. so that was fun uh but yeah it was it was a real grind and about the time our kids were were like uh they weren't that old but you know we had two kids and and i was driving in from medina ohio to downtown cleveland every day uh usually at like five in the morning um and while i would have others close up it was usually you know a 10-hour day um and we just decided made you know the store wasn't doing well we were you know my bad business decisions had cost us <laughs> and it just made more sense for me to i'd done some writing while i had the store uh but not as much as i would have liked so we just decided well why don't you stay at home you know, you can take care of the kids. And when they're at school, you can write. And when I come home, you know, when my wife comes home, I could write. So that's when I became, you know, a stay at home dad. That's cool. A <laughs> couple more questions. Um, looking at your bio, probably Wikipedia is where I was looking. <laughs> <laughs> Mentions a cup, you know, the bastion of accuracy. That's what I always call Wikipedia. Yes. But, you know, you get things on there. And sometimes it's, it, most of the time it's true. Sometimes it isn't. But anyway, um, it says you won two major awards. And the, the first one, I'm not even sure what it is. It's a 1972 Goeth, Goeth Award. What is that? I what okay, <laughs> John and Maggie Thompson did their own awards after the Alley Awards had gone by, and I and in it was a Gerda was some a historical figure. I am not. I don't quite remember what his connection to comics were. Uh, so how do you pronounce it, Gerda? Gerda. 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 Okay, I misspelled it. <laughs> um, okay. And I won for best fan writer. Oh, okay. So what and, were you doing then that warranted that? Uh, 19... Well, I was I was writing for so many fanzines that was oh, ridiculous. Okay, it wasn't one was, specific thing. I, okay. I was writing okay. comic strips for Carl Gafford's Minotaur. Uh, I was writing columns for other, you know, fanzines. I mean, you know, at that point, that's that my life was basically working, dating, and writing. Wow. <laughs> and I didn't do as much dating as I did working or writing. <laughs> That's cool. Um, then the other major award is, uh, and I know what this award is, the 2013 Ink Pod Award. Was that for yes. something specific or is that just no, a they, life, lifetime invite, achievement type thing? If they invite you as a guest to, to Comic-Con, they give you one of these lifetime achievement awards, which I always find is amusing when, when like somebody who's at the time they get the award, they've been in the business like two years and they're getting this Ink Pot Award, supposedly <laughs> for lifetime achievement. But I don't knock it because along with this award, which is a very nice award, mm -hmm. um, it means my family and I can get in a Comic-Con anytime. Oh, that's cool. They won't pay our way. Well, in, yeah. in, 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 in <laughs> travel or hotel, but mm -hmm. we can get into the convention for free anytime. Mm -hmm. So you're home based for the most part in yes. Cleveland. So Medina, you're... Ohio, which is... Oh, South okay. Of Cleveland, okay. In a town that's way too white and way too Republican for me. Oh. <laughs> but we have nice neighbors and we yeah. live on a nice street and we were close to the schools my kids attended. Yeah. Just as an aside, uh, what's your opinion, if any, on the change from Indians to Guardians for the baseball team? I, I loved it. I've been okay. again, I've hated Chief Wahoo for decades. <laughs> I was horrified when Harlan Ellison showed up at a Cleveland. Cleveland area comic convention wearing uh, a, a vintage Chief Wahoo jacket. Wow. Because, you know, Harlan, Har you know, Harlan was woke, but Harlan also never <laughs> wanted to surrender his childhood loves. And I understand yeah. a kid growing yeah. up in Cleveland at the time he did, yeah, they might have an attachment to Chief Wahoo, but it was a horrible racist symbol. Mm -hmm. and, and I was glad they got rid of that. I'm glad they got rid of the team name. The yeah. guardian statues on the bridge are beautiful works of art. Hmm. Um, so I'm real happy with, with the change of the name, assuming we ever actually play as the Cleveland. Right. <laughs> what they're Whoops. Being, the strike and everything. <laughs> That's right. I forgot about that. Um, uh, and then as another Harvey connection, you may or may not know this, but Sid Couchy drew Lada and Dot for years. He was yeah. a huge Indians fan. He probably would have uh, been fine with the change to the Guardians too. But yeah, yeah died in the wool. I think if I remember, he passed away right right after they 
won the World Series? I don't remember what year was that. Uh, sure. They they were in the World Series in or were in it at least. Yeah. Or they, they were in something. Um yeah. But anyway, he was very happy they finally made it in there. I mean, even though he lived in Essex, New York most of his life, he was like Carlin, a died in the wool Cleveland fan. So that's the only reason I brought well, that I used up. I to love going to the old Cleveland Municipal Stadium. That was great. You used to get yeah. you used to get free tickets if you got straight A's, hmm. uh, which was you know one of the few perks of being the smartest kid in your class, <laughs> which combined with being the shortest kid in your class, <laughs> usually made for some harrowing times for me. But we'd get the tickets. And back then, our parents would think nothing was letting us kids go to the game on our own. Mm. You know, we'd go by rapid transit or bus, mm. we'd go to the game, we'd have our money. Um, you know, today, I, you know, I get nervous with my 30 year old kids. <laughs> go out, go out these days. You've mentioned your height a couple of times. So how tall are you? <laughs> um, somewhere between five three and five four. I oh, think okay. I'm shrinking. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I th- I think I I used to be five eleven, but I think I'm down to five ten. But anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I'm not gonna pick on you or anything. It's just you had mentioned it a couple of times. So I go, I don't know how tall you're not. You're not standing um, up. So it's like <laughs> when when I was, or you on, might be. I am standing up. That was old Davy Jones joke. Anyway, <laughs> filming, I'm trying to think. They were filming the the third season finale. Right, I think it was of or was it the third season? No, it was second season finale. Tobias Whale ends up in a prison, mm-hmm. uh, special security prison, mm-hmm. and I'm on the set. Uh, the construction crew had shown me this prison they were building, like at ten o'clock in the morning, mm-hmm. and that evening it was done, and we were filming on it. Mm-hmm. And this thing had lights in the floor and all sorts of stuff. And Salim said, "You know, we ought to have you do a cameo in this episode." Mm-hmm. And of course, this is the last thing we're doing. Can we find a prison guard uniform for Tony? And, and and they're actually looking for one that'll fit me. And I go, wait a minute. I, I was like, Celine. Okay. Look at the prison guards you already have. And I'm already getting dirty looks from these extras because uh, they're wondering which one of us is going to get bounced for this guy. Right. And look at those guys. Uh-huh. They're big. They're beefy. They're mean looking. Look at me. <laughs> short, fat. <laughs> no matter if you find a uniform for me or not if you put me in a scene with these guards you'll end up editing me out anyway because it won't look right and and if you do leave me and people will go who's that guy <laughs> <laughs> so salim bowed to my wisdom <laughs> <laughs> and said well we'll get you in next season <laughs> So the other question I have about height, then how tall is Sinbad then? He's a very tall guy, isn't he? He's tall, not as tall as Cress Williams. Oh. Cress Williams has to be at least well over a foot taller than me. Um, But yeah, Sinbad's tall. He was. He's over six feet, isn't he? I think he's about six feet. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Um, of course, I mean, I don't been, mean basketball player tall, but I think no, you know. no, but he might, no. he might have been slouching for the photo he took of us, yeah, yeah, anyway, <laughs> just out of curiosity, okay, yeah. Um, I mean, almost we've... anybody you ask me about is going to be taller than me, right? <laughs> With a possible exception, Don McGregor. <laughs> Henry Pym is taller. Yeah, there you me. go. You can play <laughs> Ant Man in the movie. <laughs> anyway, all right. Um, well, that's pretty much all I had to ask or, uh, of you today. Um, and it was very enjoyable having you. How I usually end up my shows is I just kind of have you plug anything you're working on or if you're going to any shows i know during the pandemic a lot of shows are canceled but it's starting to open up again so i don't know uh so have the floor (laughs) when when will this air um probably end of march okay well then i can't tell you that my next convention is this weekend no (laughs) because it'll always have been happening uh you know if people follow me on facebook or follow my blog or follow me on twitter Mm-hmm. On Twitter, I think I'm uh, at the Tony Isabella. Uh, I had a at Tony Isabella account that got corrupted, mm. uh, but I'm on Facebook as Tony Isabella. 
uh, and I do my blog, Tony Isabel, Tony Isabel's bloggy thing. And that's where I keep people informed of what I'm working on and where I'll be. Okay. I know I'm going to be doing some shows in April. I'm not sure exactly which ones yet. Mm-hmm. I'm even doing a show now, but it's not out there. <laughs> I just got word I'm doing a show in Salem, Oregon. I'm in, oh. uh, so it's like an hour away from where I am. I'm in Springfield, Oregon. So. Okay. And they said, would you like to come up here? And I go, well, I guess so. You know, it's like, um, because I've never been to this show before, but it's like, other than I went to a brief show down in California, it was just a smallish show, just, and it showed how I missed doing or appearing at shows. I wasn't a guest, I was just showed up. It was just, I miss shopping. Yeah. <laughs> I miss shopping. <laughs> I, I, I love yeah. going to conventions. Yeah. I, I hope yeah. to be around to do many more of them. Yeah. One other thing, if people go to the Go Comics uh, website, uh, to follow John Lustig's Last Kiss, they yep. will find gags from me once or twice a week. Very cool. All right. Well, if there's nothing else for you today, um, again, pleasure talking to you and finally s- at least seeing you. So hopefully, we'll meet eye to eye some face to face someday. But I hope uh, so. Sir. But you know, I, I'm always thrilled and delighted that you've supported me all these years and helped me out and encouraged me and written about me and Tony's tips and stuff like that. And I've always admired your work from, you know, like I said, originally crazy of all things, you know. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I read many of the mar- of other Marvel titles and things like that, and uh, especially those black and white magazines. Um, and I appreciate you being on the show today on this episode of Fun Ideas Podcast. Happy to be here. You have a great night. You too. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye.